In this segment, we'll consider how a neuroscientist views self-forming decisions and acts. Here, I'll lay out in broad strokes the empirical view of what is known and where we need to go from here to nail down the existence of a human capacity to change human character and to determine how it might work in the brain. Since the majority of self-forming resolutions that people will start trying to live up to once they make a New Year's resolution involve improving self-control and becoming more virtuous, I'll focus here on self-control and how it may be learned. A corporation, government, military, or even an ant colony will express hierarchy, decision-making modularity, and levels of mid-level control. It would be debilitatingly slow and inefficient if a soldier, for example, had to continually ask the president where he should shoot his bullets. Rather, higher levels can play a role in training up mid- and lower-level managers, place constraints on their permissible decision-making, then allow them to decide themselves appropriately since they, after all, know local conditions best. Because of the need for efficiency and speed, information processing systems tend to evolve automatized middle levels of control. The mind is likely no exception. Yet, psychological accounts of mental control emphasize, at one extreme, automatic sensory motor control, and on the other, effortful attentional control. Modern accounts of self-control focus primarily on the role of the effortful exertion of will when thought of as a verb, or willpower when thought of as a noun or limited resource, in exercising self-control. Relatively few researchers have focused on mid-levels of control or the automatization of self-control. In contrast, Aristotle said, we become that which we do every day. Excellence is not a virtue, but a habit. He emphasized that virtue emerges over time as the good habits or automaticities of thought and action develop through the practice of effortful self-control. With practice, that which started out as effortful becomes effortless. We come to automatize certain kinds of moral behavior and decision-making that we call having good character. Can the brain sciences evaluate whether Aristotle's program is possible given how the brain learns? Volitional executive control is closely linked with endogenous attentional selection and maintenance on an object of interest while ignoring distractors with associated capacities of error detection, task planning, prioritization, and task switching. Executive control takes place in a mental workspace where operations manipulate and maintain operands and is particularly associated with two dominant frontal control networks, a so-called cingulo-opercular network centrally involved in task maintenance or staying on task, and a lateral prefrontal posterior parietal network for executing the operations of a voluntary task, which we call the dorsal attentional network. The former network has also been implicated in willpower and error detection, whereas the latter has also been implicated in voluntary attentional processing, mental imagery, and working memory. Here are some images from researchers who have made these claims. Here we see the cingulo opercular network, and here we see the dorsal attentional network. If executive control is the volitional governing of one's mental operations, Self-control is the subclass of executive control specifically involved in resisting first-order impulses and desires. Self-control refers to the capacity to govern one's thoughts and actions, particularly towards maximizing the fulfillment of one's long-term goals, principles, and second-order desires. Thus, self-control is often associated with resisting temptations and impulsive behaviors but it's also involved in making oneself persist in doing tasks, such as filling out taxes, that one might not want to do in a first-order sense, and governing the emotions. A subset of frontal lobe regions appears to govern self-control abilities, and compromised function in these frontal areas can result in increased impulsivity, such as difficulty suppressing habitual responses or difficulty suppressing the distracting effects of external stimuli in order to stay on task. The most famous example of this is Phineas Gage. He was a responsible foreman working for a train track laying company, but one day, while tamping down the gunpowder, 
Alfred Nobel had not yet invented dynamite, it exploded and blasted his tamping iron through his brain, effectively knocking out his frontal lobes. He went from being able to govern his first order desires to not being able to inhibit his baser desires and acts. He grabbed women and food as he wanted, got into fights and so forth. So in the absence of these amazing frontal lobes, we would all be Phineas Gage. These frontal lobes allow us to live, or at least try to live, according to our second order or higher desires and goals. There are substantial individual differences in self-control. Given that self-control is centrally concerned with governing impulsivity, low self-control and impulsivity are regarded by some researchers as essentially equivalent constructs. However, measures of self-control and impulsivity are not perfectly anti-correlated. High scores on self-control and low scores on impulsivity questionnaires correlate weakly but significantly with performance on many tasks that load on executive function. In the famous marshmallow test again, participants can either opt for a small reward immediately or a large reward later. The capacity to defer gratification on this test and self-control scores from questionnaires predict success in many domains later in life, including school, income, health, well-being, and relationship quality. People low in self-control are typically relatively high on impulsivity despite the lack of a, a perfect anti-correlation. High impulsivity is generally associated with negative life outcomes such as higher substance abuse, lower wealth, poor health and relationships, and greater levels of aggression and recklessness. Psychological analysis reveals three main classes of impulsivity. Motoric impulsivity, associated with acting in the absence of playing out the likely consequences of one's actions. Attentional impulsivity, associated with high distractibility and intrusive thoughts. And non-planning impulsivity, which is associated with a relative disregard for the future, being focused on the present, poor planning, and a preference uh, not to be mentally challenged. Less commonly appreciated are potentially positive aspects of impulsivity, such as spontaneity and speeded decision-making. Okay, sure, Phineas Gage was spontaneous and made decisions rashly, but who would really want to be Phineas Gage after his accident? Overall, it seems that impulsivity does not lead us to make decisions that maximize our long-term well-being. There has been a great deal of work on the automatization of motor sequences and on perceptual learning that effectively automatizes the detection of perceptual features and conjunctions of such features. There has been much less work on the automatization of cognitive decision-making operations, though it's clear that practice can lead to reduced attentional load in a task that is, at least initially, very attentionally demanding. The automatization of decision-making may draw more upon medial prefrontal areas involved in the cingulo opercular circuit and less upon lateral prefrontal areas involved in the dorsal attentional network. That is, the automatization of task maintenance may place less load on these cingulo opercular circuits known to be very active in tasks that involve active task maintenance and error detection. Initially, executive control and self-control in some new domain is likely to prove attentionally demanding. But as these processes become automatized, they likely become less so. As they become automatized to a point that they require virtually no voluntary attention, they may begin to seem effortless to a person, at which point we might consider such decision-making and self-control now a veritable part of that person's character. This may offer a neuroscientific understanding of the cultivation of Aristotelian good habits, particularly those associated with executive and self-control. Of particular interest are the implications for free will and ethics of automatized mid-level decision-making agents. For example, if a soldier who would never voluntarily choose to kill his comrades at the level of fully voluntary executive decisions has voluntarily practiced war games that have led to the wiring up of automatic decision-making agents in him that then decide to fire on enemy-like targets, in what sense is he responsible for, say, a friendly fire incident that results in his accidentally killing his comrades? He was on autopilot, so is he to blame? Well, yes, in a way, because he trained up this trigger-happy automaticity instead of one that would cause him to wait a moment before shooting at his comrades. I believe that 
if it can be shown that previously voluntary, attentionally demanding and effortful self-control and decision-making operations can be automatized, we can legitimately talk about the mechanisms of character reformation demanded by a libertarian free will, whereby we are capable of choosing to have a new kind of character in the future. With appropriate practice, we automatize decision-making such that we now have effectively automatized being a new kind of person. For example, if we were once a thief and have cultivated a new kind of decision-making in ourselves, we can eventually become a person who simply would not steal by default. This might not be the only way of reforming our nervous systems to become the kind of choosers we intend to become, but it is sufficient to prove the existence of one way to show that intentions and programs of training can reform character.